It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Reaction being the yo 513. Dead in that neighborhood. My brothers and sisters. Another hump day, another time. To go back to this man right here. And that man is Mike from that chapter. That chapter Wednesdays, y'all. Hope y'all doing excellent out there today. And I'm glad that you came on back to the channel once again. To fuck with the bean. And the title of the video is Mom and Son Vanish After Discovering Husband's Secret Life. Darkest Disappearances 5. Now, just from reading the title, y'all, I got I got a bad feeling in, inside my soul, man. I got a sinking feeling in my stomach because I just believe. That this is going to be an unsolved mystery, man. Like, seriously, y'all, I just feel that way before we even get into the video. And it's like, just from reading the title also, we can already infer or think that it's the husband the reason that the mom and son vanished. But for some reason, I just feel like the police or whatever not going to really have enough evidence to charge them. Or they never going to find the bodies and they're, it's just going to turn into a cold case. Long story short, short story long, man. I don't know why. I feel that way but hopefully that's not the case but we're about to see but before we see my brothers and sisters y'all know what y'all got to do get whatever you may need get what you need please another mic from that chapter Wednesday y'all got what y'all need y'all ready to go then let's and go in May 2017 a mother and her 15 year old son vanished in Alabama. It was very strange. They were never out of contact for long. A missing persons report was filed two months after they were last seen. However, it was then a friend of the missing mother came forward and she had an interesting story to tell. The story being, right before the mom disappeared, she had sent some emails after she found out her husband had a disturbing secret life. Hey you mm. and welcome. My name is Mike and in this old video we are once again looking at some more Creepy ass disappearances. Some of these are, you know, I'm sh they gotta be unsolved murders. We know, but we don't know. Others, just plain baffling. Let's give it a go. Let's give it a go. And get whatever you may need. And this is a friendship, friendship I'm And Mike summed up what I was trying to say, long story, short story, long too, when he was like, we know who did it, but we don't know because the police ain't gonna freaking charge the people and then they just gonna turn it into a cold case. And now we got a murderer that then got off scot free. Long story short, short story long. Let's give it a go. Our first story begins in Holtville, Alabama. Holtville, also called Slapout, which I enjoy. It's an itty bitty little place in central Alabama. Blink and it's gone. In 2017, living there was 43-year-old Susan Osborne, her 15-year-old son, Evan Chartrand, and Susan's husband, Jerry Osborne. Jerry, he wasn't uh, Evan's father, though he was Susan's husband numero two. Susan was originally from Michigan, from a loving family, and had been married to Eric Chartrand, ending up in Alabama when Eric had to move for work. They had been living there, you know, doing their thing, but unfortunately their thing became divorce. Susan was then alone with her son, Evan, and things weren't exactly going great for our Susan. She ended up having another daughter with, with a separate guy. She was broke. They were sleeping, you know, on couch to couch to couch. She ended up moving back to Michigan, and she eventually lost custody of her son, Evan, and of her daughter. Susan, eventually, mm. though, she got back on her feet. She won back custody of Evan Chartrand. Evan, by all accounts, happy-go-lucky kid, and things seemed to be on the up for Susan and Evan. 
And that's when she met Jerry Osborne. Jerry, military man. He was an Air Force veteran and had served around the world and was discharged due to a traumatic brain injury, if you can believe that, when he had encountered an IED in Iraq. So he received a medical discharge from the military and he got, um, well, PTSD as the little kind of cherry on top of that. So it seemed like the whole family were happy out, you know, doing good. Susan and Jerry married. Evan seemed to really like him. They were, they were this happy little family. Susan, she had great friends. In fact, right across the street from, you know, this happy new family of Susan, Jerry and Evan, right across the street lived Susan's best friend, Holly. And they would, you know, be in constant communication, texting each other every single day about what they were doing, what they were up to. Suddenly though, nobody could contact either Susan or Evan over the summer of 2017. And I'm telling you, man, Jerry got to be the one who did it. But I'm wondering, y'all, what is his secret to the point where he feel like he had to kill them? Like, what the hell did you not want people to know? Herself and Evan were no shows at family events. Her friend Holly, who, you know, lived across the street, who was her best friend, she actually moved across country. She so she couldn't exactly go and check on her to see if everything was OK. They weren't actually reported missing, though, if you can believe it, for almost two months. They last been heard from a Memorial Day weekend 2017, May 29th. They were reported missing July 29th. So like... How could that even happen? How could it go two months without these people being seen? I don't care if it's family members, friends, co-workers. He, he was 15. He went to school. How the hell the school ain't asked what his boy at? You know what I'm saying? Two months before they was even reported missing? Man, y'all, this is gonna look like it's gonna be a cold case, y'all, because we they literally lost 60 days of freaking uh investigation from when they first went missing. I'm already getting disappointed. What had happened? When the police were finally called, you know, to do a checkup, to do a welfare check, they rocked up to the house and Jerry was there. Jerry was still in the house. He was there. They said, How are you, Jerry? And he was there. As I said, cleaning. Susan's car was there, and Jerry's story went, Oh, yeah, oh for her? Yeah. She left me. She left me on Memorial Day weekend. Left with some guy. Susan was cheating, apparently. She later then came back to the house, packed up all her shit. Susan, her son Evan, and this mysterious guy she was having an affair with, they left. Never seen them again. Jerry had surveillance to prove, you know, that they'd come and gone, that he could show you on camera. Oh, but shit. You know what? Now that you mention it, it's been overwritten. Whoops. Neighbors would say they'd seen him burning stuff in the backyard also around Memorial Day weekend. Weird. Susan and Evan also had two dogs they'd had for years, members of the family. Jerry's dad had dropped them off at an animal shelter in early June. The wow. police were a little bit suspect of this story, which he could not back up like one iota of this entire story. So they got a search warrant to search his house. Maybe they'll find something inside there, some clues as to what had actually gone on. They found that although the home was a fairly new, re new build, Jerry had just recently like ripped up everything, new floors repainted the walls, done everything in, it's like, this house is like brand new, what are you doing? Except the kitchen and the bathroom, however, which when luminol was applied, you know, under a UV light, it lit up like crazy. There was blood everywhere, on the floor, on the walls, on the ceiling, but unfortunately when the police wanted to, you know, test it, it was too degraded to actually say whose blood that was. Cadaver dogs also led to a spot in the garden where the burn pit had been and neighbors reported hearing gunshots on Memorial Day weekend. Mm. Other than that though, nothing. It was like the mother and son vanished off the face of the earth. No activity on banks, social media, no nothing. Never to be heard from again. It's clear as day that he did it. It is clear as freaking day. But like I keep saying, y'all, I got a feeling he's not gonna get charged for it. Something had happened on Memorial Day weekend, which would be gunshots, a burn pit where bodies had, had been, and then nearby the home, nearby this little town, is a big-ass lake, which will take you a while to search. So it was during all of this, you know, the investigation that Susan's friend, Holly, who is now living across country, she came forward and she was like, you know, just before, a couple of weeks before I'd last heard from her, she, she'd kind of been acting a little bit weird. As I said, they were in constant communication. In fact, Holly was one of the first people to start worrying about Susan when you know, she was texting her, no answer, calling her, not getting anywhere. She even wrote letters that were just sent mail straight back to her. Just a few weeks before Susan and Evan vanished, Susan sent an email to Holly. It was titled, Don't Mention This in Text. 
Well, color me intrigued. See, Susan was saying Jerry wasn't exactly the nice guy he seemed like on the surface. He was extremely possessive and controlling. He wouldn't let her see her family. He made her quit her job. He checked her texts, he checked her phone, so email was the only way that Susan and Holly could communicate without Jerry knowing. Susan had come to believe that her husband Jerry was secretly a gay escort. What? Her suspicions began when he was always at work, working late, didn't answer his phone, and was out of town for days on end. She thought maybe he was having an affair, but not exactly this kind of affair. She then found some emails between himself and the lads over on boyscourt.com. And well, she found this ad with his real phone number on it, and he had those tattoos. Hey there guys, my name is Jay, and I'm looking for older, generous gentlemen to spend some quality time with. What? It's uh, surprising, to say the least. Now, she, when she was sending all this to Holly about what she'd found, she said she hadn't confronted him about it yet. Then, a few days later, Susan emails again, and it's like, you know what, I, we spoke, I had a sit-down conversation with Jerry, and you know, it's all good. Happy it. You know, it's all water under the bridge. That's a lot of water to go under a bridge. However, then, just a few days later, Susan and Evan vanished. Disappeared after learning his secrets. Quite a twist, but ultimately extremely tragic, as to date, they remain missing. Jerry always has, and to this date does, maintain he had nothing to do with their disappearance, that he was telling the truth, that she left willingly with some other guy, and to this day, the case remains open. <coughs> it was New Year's Day. What the fuck? Is that it? Oh, we got some more, man. Mike, please. I mean, but damn, man, that is kind of it. Because he said to this day, the case remains open. I told y'all, man. I already knew it, man. I just I had that freaking feeling in my soul, my brothers and sisters. And it, it, it's so crazy what his secret is. I would have never guessed it in a million years. I would have never guessed that one right there. And it's not the fact that he was um doing homosexual sexual activities. You know what I'm saying? That's not the part. Man, if you're gay, you're gay, whatever, whatever. It's the fact that not only you was cheating on her, but you was selling yourself to other people. You know what I'm saying, man? You were doing something strange for a little piece of change. That's the part that just like, whoa. I hope that ain't the end, though, man. Come on, Mike. Give us a couple of more details. And you know, all is quiet on New Year's Day, especially. Listen to this in, in, in Malaga, Spain, 2008. This well, I guess that was the end, man, because now we go to New Year's Day over in a whole completely different country. How many uh, videos, different stories Mike got in this one, y'all? It's freaking 50 minutes long, so this is going to be nice, man. Mike giving us a light on this one, but I just knew that first case. Oh, my God. Place was Mijas Costa on the southern coast of Spain, a pretty little town overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. Living there this January 1st, 2008, was 15-year-old Amy Fitzpatrick. She was living with her mother Audrey, stepfather David, and brother Dean. See, Amy and her family were originally from Dublin, Ireland, and had moved to Spain for work. Stepdad, he sold real estate there, so the family upped six, and here they were. Now, young 15-year-old Amy, she did not like living in Spain. She wanted to go home back to Dublin. Was not a fan. She was depressed there. She didn't really have many friends. She just didn't like it. They had moved over in 2004, so they had been living there for almost four years by this stage, but she never settled. She skipped school. She would run away all the time. She would sleep on benches, all that sort of thing. In her diary, she wrote about the you know, tension that, that was going on in the house. It seemed like there was tension between herself and her stepdad, David Mann. Now, she was supposed to go back and spend Christmas back in Dublin with her biological dad, but that fell true. So she was, you know, even more upset and depressed than usual at this time when New Year's Eve came around just a couple of days later. So Amy ended up spending New Year's Day with her best friend, Ashley. They were babysitting for the day in Ashley's home. It was shortly after 10 p.m. that night, Amy was, was due to head back to her own house. But it was only like a 10 minute walk from Ashley's to Amy's, you know, along this little dirt, dirt road. But on that lonely dirt road, Amy vanished. Now, initially the Fitzpatrick family didn't report Amy missing for a day, because as I said, you know, it wasn't uncommon for her to like, sleep rough, spend time with friends, or just out somewhere. They didn't even really know anything was off to begin with. But then, once the police were alerted, shit got real, real quick. Now, Audrey mm. and Dave were absolutely positive that Amy never came home that night. That, you know, she left Ashley's, and then she disappeared. 
She never once came home and then left, you know what I mean? But Amy also didn't, you know, have a passport, she didn't have money. So her running away would seem very, very strange. The police search was slow to get started, but now there's intense activity as the Spanish authorities are out in force looking for her. Meanwhile, her family can only wait and hope. This is the path that Amy Fitzpatrick took that night, an unlit, lonely track surrounded by undergrowth. But search teams have found nothing here, no sign of the 15-year-old. And if she has indeed vanished, it's without a trace. I just want to appeal to anyone who may be holding Amy against her will. Please, let my baby Bunton go. She's a loving kid who would never do anyone any harm. She'll be frightened. Please don't hurt her. And Amy, if you're there and the time is going on and you're afraid to come home, please don't be afraid. There's nothing to be scared of. We just want you back with us where you belong. Today. Now, I might be tripping, y'all, but it seems like Mike is alluding to that uh, Amy's stepdaddy, the one who was just calling uh, her mama while she's sitting up there crying about her disappearance. That guy was the one who actually killed her or did something to her. Mike seemed like he'd been alluding to that, and that would be crazy, man, for him to have been to kill this little girl or did whatever he did to her, and then you got the audacity to be sitting up there calling and calling her mother. Man, some people, I don't know if that's true, but if that is true, man, it's just like, wow, people will never cease to amaze you. A 230 emergency service personnel continued the search, which has now been extended as far as Marbella. Despite criticism of a delayed response by all involved initially, those leading the operation remain optimistic. What happened? No one knows. There was an absolutely massive search by the Spanish authorities, and it brought to light absolutely nothing. But see, here is where things get, get like, you know, weird, weirdo, weird. As I said, Audrey and Dave, stepfather, they absolutely claim Amy never came home after, you know, she was babysitting at her best friend's house. But what's weird is that Amy was with Ashley, babysitting there, and Ashley would say she had seen Amy with her phone, with her mobile phone, one of those old Blockia phones, Nokia's. And then she vanished. That pink Nokia, however, was later found in the Fitzpatrick house. Mm. So how'd it get there? Mm. Months later, in August 2008, that phone, which had been recovered and was now in the custody of the family lawyer, it went missing again. Someone broke into the lawyer's place, stole the phone, and they also stole a laptop that had been used in the investigation into missing Amy. Then, in June 2009, so a year and a half later, Audrey claimed she received a call from a man saying he knew where Amy was, that Amy had been kidnapped and was in Madrid. It was a ransom call, a half million euros to get her back. The police investigated but didn't find anything, so likely it was bullshit. So what really happened to Amy as she walked home that night? If she did indeed walk home? Well, there were some reported sightings of her in different bars and stuff like that around, around that time. Some people have said they, they seen her at the bar. Even though she was young, it seems like Spanish are pretty relaxed about younger people drinking in bars, or some people said they seen her in the company of an older man. Who really knows? I don't know. Some claim she may have been abducted by a gangster. This part of Spain is frequented by a lot of Irish gang members, so maybe she was involved somehow with one of them. Maybe when she was sleeping rough, she met somebody. Who knows? Audrey was unsatisfied with what the police were doing, so she actually hired a private investigator. A private investigator who'd worked on the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Great, hire a person who couldn't solve the most famous mystery in Spain. Way to go. The Fitzpatrick family, eventually, they they moved back to Dublin. Uh, Amy was never found. Nothing of her hers was ever found. It was like she completely vanished. And here things get even weirder. Dave, the stepfather, later killed Dean, Amy's brother. It was claimed there was some kind of argument and Dave just somehow ended up stabbing him to death in their home. He ended up serving an entire five-year prison what? sentence for that one, and then when he got out of prison, he later ended up getting back with Audrey after one of her kids disappeared under very mysterious circumstances, and the other one was killed under kind of mysterious circumstances. Oh, hell no! I'm done on this one. I'm done for so many different reasons, my brothers and sisters. Bean team, follow me real quick. Stay with me real quick. Number one, I'm done just because that man is a freaking murderer, and it's clear as day that he, um, 
uh, after he killed his son, it's clear as day that he uh, murdered uh, Amy too. You know what I'm saying? Just He got away with that one, and he was a repeat offender. That's number one. Number two, he only spent five years in fucking prison for that shit. And let's put the cherry on top with number motherfucking three. Yes, hide your children. Now the cuss words coming out. This is bullshit. The cherry on goddamn top is the fact he got back with the damn wife who is the mother of the people he killed. What the fuck? Yeah, I'm done, man. We ain't even halfway through this. This is so fucking crazy, these first two stories from Mike, man. I Both of these first two stories have brought out some emotions in me. Long story short, short story long. I don't even know if I can keep going, man. G she, man, you know what? Let's put another fourth one in there. Let's go to number four. And this is why I throw my theory out there, y'all. And I know y'all thinking about it, too. Number four, with all that shit. I said in uh one through three, number four leads me to believe that she got damn had something to do with it too. Or she at least know that he uh killed Amy. She at least knew. Man, this is man, I don't know. I don't know. My damn head's starting to get all scrambled up now. Let me calm back down and let's go. By this guy. So man for one man. According to Ashley, Amy didn't like her stepdad Dave at all. She called him creepy, said he made her skin crawl. Who knows what really happened, it's, it's chilling that she could have just vanished on a walk home. If she did, because maybe she made it home. This next story, and yes I am recording this- Man, Mike, he throwing these stories that are so quick, like I need a second to think about what the freak we just heard. I'm loving this, Mike. Let's go. After my vacation, thanks for noticing, involves a creepy ass disappearance in the Sierra National Forest, and maybe, just maybe, a ghost. Sandra mm. Johnson Hughes was in 2020 54 years of age, and she had just moved from Hawaii to California. Aunt Sandy, as she was known to her beloved niece, she had no children of her own, she had been married twice, she had been divorced twice. You know, outdoors, camping, That she had even studied to be a park ranger at one point in her life, so very experienced outdoors woman, she was always out hiking, she was always out camping, she had no fear of the wilderness, she'd be gone for days, weeks by herself, and classic Sandy. So I'm pretty sure I know this story, man, because I remember those face. I remember her face, man. I think this comes from a Mr. Balling, y'all. If you know, you know, I'm not going to tell what actually happened, but I think we have heard this story from Mr. Balling before. But let's check it out from my uh, perspective. Reports state that she moved from Hawaii to California. Others just say she went to California just to go hiking. But regardless, this was in June 2020, right at the at the height of the of the pandemic, and she was gonna go get away from all those disgusting human beings with their coughs, and she was gonna go hiking in the Sierra National Forest, not far from Yosemite National Park. As I said, this was something she did. You know, solo hiking was something she did all the time. This was in a beautiful part of the world. Who could blame her? Not this guy. Hmm. It was in late June that Sandy traveled from Fresno and up and up she went into the wild, into the Sierra National Forest. This would have been her for sure. Plenty of campgrounds, lakes, beautiful vistas, the works. And then, on June 26th, 2020, Sandy contacted her family. She was, she was in great, great spirits. But of course, here comes the fall. That time when she contacted her family, June 26th, that was the last time they heard from her. In fact, that's the last time we really know anything certain about Sandra Johnson Hughes. After that, when she went out of contact, nobody was really worried. As I said, she did solo hiking by herself all the time. And, you know, she was in the, the depths of the mountains, so, you know, contact would be sparse at best. But after that, some very strange things happened, and even stranger things were seen by others. See, on July 2nd, right, this is less than a week after she had last been heard from, a couple of campers came across this deserted campsite, and it was, like, completely disheveled, upended. The tent was there, but it was flattened. Shit, basically just shite all over the ground in this campsite. It looked as if bags had been, like, upended, as if somebody had been looking for something, something like that, but there was nobody around. It looked like this had been deserted for a couple of days by July 2nd. So whose camp did these guys find, and where were the campers? These hikers they called the park rangers, as this looked very suspicious at the time. It didn't look like animal activity or anything. This looked like 
something had happened here. What that something was is a completely different question, but something not good. So these hikers, they called the park rangers who arrived, they had a goo around, and they found a wallet, a purse, and identification. That identification? It was Sandra Johnson Hughes. This was her campsite, but she was nowhere to be found. And what was weird is that, as I said, Sandy, very experienced outdoors woman, and she was very orderly. She wouldn't do something like this. She always, like, prepared, camped right. You know, she wouldn't, like, leave her shit laying around. She wasn't there, but booty. That doesn't mean she wasn't seen. It was two days mm. later, on July 4th, that she was seen near a place called Chiquito Pass. It's about 20 miles north from where her campsite had been. The witnesses who saw her said she was acting very strange. She was walking around, but she was barefoot and she had a big old bruise on her face. And so other hikers who saw her walking through this forest, you know, they, hey, do you need help? Are you okay? And she, no, I'm fine. She kept on marching on into the wild. She refused, but she said, she, like they said, she wasn't that weird, even though she looked weird barefoot with a big old bruise, but she was, you know, declined their requests for assistance and off she went. It was these hikers, it was when they got back to town, they saw missing persons posters for Sandra and they were like, oh, that was her. So something This one of those real correct cases, y'all. And yes, this came from Mr. Ballin. We watched this before from Mr. Ballin. But this one of those real cases where I kind of like want to believe, even though this don't make no sense, but it's the only thing that I can it lead me to believe that that lady just lost her damn mind. Like, seriously, I don't know how she end up losing her mind. She, like, I don't know how Alzheimer's work. I don't know if it's that or another different type of disease or whatever the word is. But she lost her mind. Long story short, story long. That's the only thing that I can believe. For her to just leave her campsite and just start walking around barefooted. Got a bruise on her face. She probably got that from falling or something. I don't know if she hit her head on something. Then she just turned crazy. I don't know. But it is, this is just one of those real cases where I believe the witnesses actually seen her. They ain't just blowing smoke up, I'll tell. Because there's multiple witnesses. And I think it's some more, too. And long story short, story long. She was just walking around. And she lost her mind. And she probably died from starvation or dehydration or when i say lost her mind she probably wasn't even freaking drinking water no more she just walking or something i don't know y'all this is a weird one this is most definitely a weird one something was clearly very wrong with sandra something was clearly not no no way no, right here it was the day after that i'm talking july 5th that her car was found her silver sob it was found near where she had last been seen chiquito pass and it was like down a hill. So her car was off the road, collided with a tree. But the authorities said the collision wasn't that bad. They said it must have been very slow. So it probably rolled down the hill and then impacted a tree. That could then kind of explain how Sandy got from her campsite, which was upended and deserted, to Chiquito Pass, which would have been a seven mile hike or, well, not that long a drive. That collision could maybe also explain why she was in such a state. The bruise on her face, Something happened, she was driving, went off-road, but what happened to the campsite? Why was that upended? Something was very, very weird here, and all the while, there was huge searches going on for Sandra. You know, there's missing persons posters. As soon as they found her deserted campsite, missing persons posters went up. They had search and rescue in the area trying to find her, then they had weird sightings, and then they had her car. The only thing they didn't have was Sandra. A very experienced outdoors woman. This was this situation was very worrying. The cops actually left her car there, collided with the tree, thinking, well, maybe she'll come back for it. And they left this note attached to the car, saying, your family is worried about you, but it doesn't appear she ever came back. The area she was last seen in, this Chiquito Pass, it's pretty deep um, into the Sierra National Forest. It's where the mountains really begin. It's a very treacherous, very treacherous area. So this entire situation just became very worrying for, for everybody involved. And as I said, they had search and rescue, they had helicopters. They couldn't find her. It was then a month later after all of that, that on August 9th, 2020, two hunters were driving down the road and they saw a woman leaning against a tree off the road. They said she was there, she looked, she didn't seem like she was in distress. She didn't wave at them. She didn't interact with these guys as they drove by at all. Didn't seem upset, didn't wave, didn't try and flag him down, nothing. 
This was about a three hour hike from where her car was found. So again, in a in another different area of the Sierra National Forest and the two hunters, they drove by her, they saw her, and it was only when they got back to town, they saw the missing persons posters. Oh, that was Sandra Johnson Hughes that they saw. They said it was definitely her, but she was much thinner than she looked in the pictures, which I guess that's what over a month in, in the National Forest will do to you. But again, this is just another, you know, scenario that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. What was she doing? How had she survived that long? Her surviving that long in the forest is very explainable. She was a very experienced outdoors woman. But if she was experienced enough and had her wits better enough that she was able to survive that long, why hadn't she contacted anybody? She must have known people were looking for her at this stage. The situation just seemed absolutely bizarre. Was she avoiding people? What had happened back at her campsite that it was in such a state that it had been completely upended? What had happened with her car? Had the collision been intentional, unintentional? Who knows? Maybe there had been an incident back at her campsite. She had gotten in a car to go get help, but she'd driven deeper into the forest, not back to civilization. The whole situation is very eerie, for sure. After that sighting by the two hunters in August 2020, there'd be no more sightings of Sandra Johnson Hughes. And in fact, a couple of weeks after that, the entire area would be engulfed in flames. There would be a big wildfire that would rip through all of these valleys, destroying all these parts of the, of the forest. Her car had been left there. Her car wasn't engulfed in flames. And after the fires were put out, the police would eventually remove her vehicle from that area. But through all of this, there was never any more sightings of Aunt Sandy. A disturbing case for sure. What actually happened, nobody knows. And four years later, as I'm making this video that you're looking at, there's been no updates, no sightings of her. Well, that's not exactly true. Because mm -hmm. about a year after she was last seen in the summer of 2021, there was a sighting. Kind of. In July 2021, the Gorba family from California were going on a little vacation into the Sierra National Forest. It was parents Jake and Victoria Gorba and their three children. They were having a grand old time, you know, looking at the birds and the bees and the valleys and the trees and just enjoying the beauty of this part of the world. Only thing is, their oldest child, three-year-old Caden, he saw something just a little bit different. Something no one else saw. The family were in their car at Should I Peak, for reference, about an hour and 45 minutes by car from where Sandy's campsite had been. So the family were there, they'd pulled off to the side of the road, they were munching out on some lunch, and Caden is looking at the window of, of their vehicle. And in a nearby meadow, he sees something. He said, there's a woman standing there, and she's looking right at us. Parents were in the car also, they didn't see anybody. But Caden was clearly looking at something and something was looking right back at him. Caden said, there's a lady over there in the meadow. She has blue hair. She's wearing a black shirt. She needs our help, but she's dead. She's lying face down on the ground with her legs up in the air. She can't talk to me, but she's over there. We need to help her. Jake and Victoria, his parents that went over, they didn't see jack shit. Now Caden was adamant. She was standing right there. She needed her help, like, they went over there, even, even after his parents went over there, they looked around. They couldn't see anybody, they couldn't see anybody in the ground, or standing, he was still adamant, trust me, trust me, she's right there. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry kid, you're not getting in the car. Kids say some creepy ass shit, and uh, how about you? You can stay here. So regardless, the family, <laughs> they eventually- I forgot all about that part of the story, y'all, of the little boy seeing her, looking at him, but he was saying that she dead, and then the parents couldn't see him. I forgot all about that freaking part, man. This one of those ones, and I think I was calling her this when we first watched this video, or uh, heard about this story from Mr. Ballin, or Mr. Ballin was saying that when she almost like a Bigfoot type of entity or being a human she the human bigfoot man because uh, you, it's, it's sightings of her by certain people but she very elusive then she out in the freaking wilderness in the forest you know what i'm saying man it's almost like she a 
freaking folk tale. But the thing about this is, I do believe those witnesses actually seen this woman. Like, you know, you got people who say they seen Bigfoot and ain't seen nothing but a goddamn gorilla. You know what I'm saying, man? But I think people really were seeing this woman in the, the freaking woods, man. And I, I, I just got to believe that she just lost her mind. Some kind of way she lost her mind. And she went back home and then his mom, Victoria, she posted this uh, on Facebook saying, hey, you won't believe what the creepy shit kids say, am I right? It was then they learned of missing Sandy who disappeared about five miles from here. A sheriff's corporal, he later stumbled across this post and when, you know, the authorities went over to speak to them, to speak to Caden, he described Sandra to a T, to the blue hair, to the black shirt she was last seen wearing by the witnesses in the park. Now later on, the, the sheriff, uh, Jake, the dad, and Caden, the son, they went back to this area where he's already seen her, and the, the police, you know, the authorities, they had a look around this area. They found nothing there, but he was adamant he had seen her, and he could describe her. There's a lady over in the meadow in a black shirt, and um, she, oh, I got goosebumps, he says, she needs our help, but she's dead. Jake and Victoria checked out the meadow, but saw nothing. He kept saying, trust me, trust me, mom. And I was like, I trust you, bud. You know, I believe you 100%. Spooked, the couple decided to end the trip early and head home. And we put it on Facebook, seeing if anybody knew anything about the area um, and come to find out that there was a lady missing. Caden and his dad returned with two sheriff's deputies the next day, but found nothing. If she was possibly a ghost looking for some help. I hope that he could have at least helped and maybe help the family find her because it's been a long time apparently since she's been gone. Whether that was just a figment of his imagination or uh, a real ghost, who knows? Maybe, you know, he's seen a missing persons poster when they were driving to this area and put two and two together. I don't know. I mean, he was only three years old, so it's very, very weird situation, but it's creepy as heck for sure. And to date, Sandra Johnson Hughes has never been found. All right, let's go to Busan, South Korea for, for one of them Ooh. battlers, right? Busan, south, uh, southeast coast of South Korea, very beautiful city. Really, really recommend it if you ever get a chance to go to Korea. But there, a very terrifying case of a couple, newlyweds who just completely vanished in the most inexplicable ways. It happened back in 2016. They were Choi Sung-hee and her husband, Kim Yoon Suk. Sung Hee, she was a well-known theater actress in Busan. She was in their production. She'd be walking down the street, she'd get a hell yeah, Sung Hee. You know, everybody knew her. She was a very talented actress and well-known in, in the city. While her husband, Kim Yoon Suk, he ran a, a restaurant in the city. It was kind of like a family business, and it seems like it was quite a, he ran quite a successful restaurant as well. So there were, you know, a couple who were doing relatively good. Um, they lived in an apartment in Busan. They'd gotten married in late 2015. So by May 2016, they were about six months married. And a choice some he, she was in fact uh, pregnant, if you can believe that. So by all accounts, very happy come summer 2016. And summer 2016, May 2016, that's when what happened... happened. On the night of May 27th, 2016, Choi Sung-hee was out and about, working, rehearsing, doing her thing, and she was seen arriving home to her apartment building in Busan at around 11.31pm. She had just been to the grocery store and she had some plastic bags with her, as you can see. Then, about four hours later, hubby Kim Yoon Suk arrived to the apartment, arrived home. This was about 3.45am. He'd been out drinking soju and mekju and was having a great old time with his co-workers at the restaurant. So they both arrived home that night pretty late at different times, but they were clearly seen on CCTV entering their apartment. They're I'm just gonna throw this out there, y'all, and it may be crazy, but I, I just kind of got a feeling about this one too. I'm thinking that whoever, uh, I'm thinking they got kidnapped, but what I'm really thinking is they got kidnapped by a gang or over there, what they call the mafia or whatever, whatever the terminology. Like, I feel like it was a group of people that, uh, kidnapped them. And the reason I'm saying that is because we probably going to find out about something they had going on as far as like the, uh, husband, Kim, you, he was a uh, business owner with restaurants. Maybe he was getting extorted by a Pacific gang, like the triads or something i don't know y'all it's just something that's going through my brain that may come to uh fruition let's see 
the really scary thing is they were never ever seen leaving their apartment. The couple were reported missing to the police about two days later by Kim Yoon Suk's dad. He hadn't heard from his son in a couple of days, contacted him, ringing him, texting him, going to the apartment. All went nowhere. The police opened an investigation into the missing couple about a week after they were last seen. So the police seen the CCTV of them entering their apartment building. Police went to their apartment and they were not there, but there was no CCTV of them exiting at all. And this is where things get even stranger. Their phones, both of their phones, had been used since they were last seen. Choi Sung Hee texts had been sent from her phone to the director of the theater where she worked, um, saying that she wouldn't make it to rehearsals. The text said that uh, she was feeling unwell, and then uh, she later would say that she wouldn't be back at all because she had to go to the hospital as she had uh, an accident, quote, like last time. Now what that meant is that Choi Sung Hee had a history of uh, self-harm and depression, and so that's what they took to meant, that maybe she had hurt herself once again. So that is like, kind of odd but not that strange what started to worry the director when he was getting those texts from her phone is that the language was very formal like a lot of languages you know there's the informal and formal version of the language and choice so he would usually talk to this person in the informal way so the texts were written just a little bit weird and calls to her phone to try and speak with her they went nowhere her phone was was disconnected the director of this theater later got a call from someone claiming to be Kim Yoon Suk, his star's husband, saying, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, she's in the hospital, she's really unwell, I'm so sorry, you know, if her not being able to act is, like, disrupting the production and yada yada yada. Now, the director assumed this was Kim Yoon Suk, her husband. The thing was, though, the director had never met him, so he was unable to say if that was actually his voice or not. The police followed up on this and no. Choi Sung Hee had not been admitted to any hospital in Busan, any hospital in the country. The restaurant uh, that Kim Yoon Suk ran, uh, that they got calls claim from someone claiming to be him and saying, you know, he was feeling unwell and he wouldn't be back for a couple of days. Now, the, the employee who answered the call said it kind of sounded like him, but he sounded exhausted. And the more they thought about it, it sounded like someone who knew his voice and was imitating imitating him. Interestingly, Kim Yoon Suk's phone last pinged from Busan, where they lived, but Choi Sung Hee's phone last pinged from Seoul, which is like three hours away. So the police did not buy that these texts and calls had actually been sent by the missing couple, the missing newlyweds, and then, you know, investigating the apartment where they had last been known to be, things got even stranger. So they knew they'd gone in, but couldn't find any evidence of them leaving, but they weren't there. There was no signs of a break-in in the apartment. There was no signs of a struggle in the apartment. Their dog was there. Their dog was there, it was alive. Now it was in quite a state after having been left alone for a good couple of days, but it was still there, it was alive. The groceries that Choi Sung Hee was seen on CCTV bringing into her apartment, they were there on the kitchen countertop, still in those plastic bags. Weirdly, there was more grocery stores in Choi Sung Hee's car, which was parked in the apartment building's garage. So it seemed like she'd been walking in, in that CCTV with some groceries, and then she was meant to go back down and get the rest of the groceries from her car. But she didn't, for some reason. The scene made no- I'm telling you, man, this is like a hit, man. Like, this is a gang doing this. This is a mafia hit, man. This is a cartel that did this to them, man. Like, I believe they was already in the, inside their apartments before they even arrived home, sitting, waiting on them. You know what I'm saying? They waited on her. She was the first one to arrive, kidnapped her, tied her up, did all that, and then waited on the husband to show up and got him too. But the crazy part is, why don't we see them back on the footage in the uh, elevator leaving? You know what I'm saying, man? How did they uh, kidnap them away from the cameras, so to speak? I don't know. This one this, this one of those ones where you're going to always have questions, man. You're going to always have questions. No sense. So the groceries were there, there was unwashed dishes in the sink, but there was missing wallets, missing passports, a missing laptop. On one hand, maybe they ran away, but on the other hand, why did they leave all of this stuff here? And why? It just didn't make any sense at all. So what could have happened in the apartment? Was somebody waiting for them 
in their apartment. Choi Sung-hee, she went in, she was going to go back down again, but somebody was lying in wait for her. And then when her husband Kim Yoon suk came home about four hours later, there was somebody waiting for him also. But if that happened, there was no signs of a struggle, and then there's no CCTV of anybody leaving, any, somebody, no CCTV of somebody dragging bodies out. Almost every- Exactly what I was just saying, man. Mike just said exactly what I just said. Crazy. The exit to the building had a camera, except the emergency exit. But in the vicinity of the emergency exit, there was a camera. So long story short, you could technically exit the building without being seen, but you would have to know this exact route, know the position of every camera, and even walk underneath a camera at one point to avoid being seen. You would need to know the building extremely well and be extremely careful, and if you were carrying bodies, that would be almost impossible. And who would do this? The couple had no history of financial debts, or maybe something nefarious going on. But there was another woman who police think could be involved, and this was Kim Yoon Suk's ex-girlfriend. She's only been named as Yoon. It's believed that Kim Yoon Suk had a secret second cell phone that he used to communicate with his ex-girlfriend. They had been dating a couple of years prior, they had actually been almost engaged at one point, but allegedly their families didn't get on very well, so that led to them breaking up. She went and married somebody else, but divorced after a month. She divorced this other guy because this other guy believed she was still seeing Kim Yoon Suk. They were having an affair, even though their families hated each other. They had strong feelings for sure, or at least she did for him. Maybe he did for her if he, if he still had a second cell phone that she used to communicate. She later had a, this mysterious Yoon woman, she later had a miscarriage that it's reportedly she blamed Kim Yoon Suk for. Regardless, Yoon, she married another guy, then moved to Norway, if you can believe that. But it's believed she had issues, as I said, regarding a miscarriage. She believed Kim Yoon Suk ruined her life, and at the time, the newlywed couple disappeared. She was in South Korea. She was mysteriously in South Korea. She didn't tell her family she was back in her home country. She was staying in motels and paying for everything in cash. And she was due to head back to Norway in June. But as soon as the investigation into the missing newlyweds began, she suddenly decided to get an extra flight to go back to Norway even earlier. So the police believe she has, she maybe she has information. They just want to speak to her. They want to ask her a few questions about her missing ex-boyfriend and his, his wife. But when they asked, you know, Norway to extradite her to send her back to South Korea, Nor Norway refused. They said there was no evidence tying her to this mysterious disappearance, so they refused to send her back. She has never returned to Seoul, whether she even has anything to do with what we don't even know happened. Who knows? But who... And what happened in that apartment in Busan to this day, eight years later, remains a complete mystery. That's one of those ones where you can't even begin to try to, like, even know where to start to figure out what happened to them. Like, seriously, I, and that's also one of those ones where I don't think, well, I don't know, y'all. I'll put it this way. I don't think that the ex-girlfriend did it. Now, I'm not saying that she don't know who did it or she didn't set it up or if she did do it, she had help. If she did do it, she didn't do it alone. And even that don't make no sense because of the CCTV footage. Like, there's no footage of them. Even if you had some footage of some people or one person carrying walking some suitcases down the damn hallway or something that would give us an indication that okay you may have their bodies in that suitcase you know what i'm saying we ain't getting none of that man you know what i'm gonna throw this craziness out there and i'm not saying i believe it but it's the only thing that i can even come to as far as a conclusion to what may have happened to them Maybe it was somebody who worked inside the damn building who did it to him, who got access to the damn cameras and they was turning the cameras off or moving them to the side or something. I don't know, y'all. I don't freaking know, man. That is so freaking effed up. Like, we have no clue, no idea, no nothing. It wasn't even no struggle in the freaking house. We don't know where they bodies, man. That's one of the ones that I wake up in the middle of the night like, what the freak happened to them? I don't know. This has been wild, y'all. We still got a couple of more. Let's go.
In March of 1991, four-year-old Michael Donahue was having a grand old time at an elementary school playground, you know, going on the swings, playing hide-and-go-seek, all that kind of stuff. The, the glory days of childhood. This was in Victoria, British Columbia. The Dunahy family was made up of parents Bruce and Crystal, and then their four-year-old son Michael and his baby sister Caitlin. That day, Mom Crystal was playing in a local flag football game in a park beside the nearby elementary school. Crystal would play, Bruce and the kids, you know, would watch, but as there was a playground nearby, Michael, four-year-old little lad, kind of potters over to the, to the swings, sees all the other kids playing and wants to join in. Nothing weird so far, but I'm going to get to the weird part because what happened right after is a complete mystery. Michael was only by himself for a couple of minutes. Uh, Crystal, she was getting ready for a flag football game. She didn't want to leave her son walking over to the playground by himself, but Bruce, he was just a couple of minutes away with their other uh, baby girl, so she was like, he'll be fine for a couple of minutes, even though it made her uneasy. Then it was reported by the kids who were in the playground that they were playing hide and seek, and that Michael was due to go and hide. The kids were gonna count to 10 and then go look for him, but for some reason they only counted to five, because kids are little cheaters, but when they opened their eyes to start looking for him after the count of five, he was gone. The kids were looking and they couldn't find him. Then Bruce went to go find Michael so they could watch the football game together. He couldn't find him either. Soon everyone was alerted. The football game was cancelled until they could find him, so everyone was looking around this area. And as you can see, it, it was pretty, it's pretty open. Not many places to hide unless you went across the road, or were taken across the road. Okay, time out, man. Time out, my brothers and sisters. We all have played hide and go seek in our lives, in our childhood lives especially. You know what I'm saying, man? We have all played it. But this is the part I'm not understanding about this. They was playing reverse hide and go seek or something because the rules to hide and go seek is one person count to 10 or 20 or 30 or whatever while everybody else go hide. You know what I'm saying, man? But they played it where... Uh, everybody else counted to 10, 20, or 30 while one person went and go hid. Some just sound crazy as hell to me. I have never played that version of High and Go Seek a day in my life, man. But, dude, what could have happened in those five seconds that those kids claimed that they counted with their eyes closed? Do y'all think just a, a grown adult just came and just snatched them up and shut his mouth and ran real fast, threw them in the car, and took off? That sound a little too movie-ish to me. Like, that sound like a freaking superhero type is, or a villain, a villain that got superpowers can do something like that. I don't know, man. God damn, y'all. I did not expect all this craziness, Mike. Let's go. Let's see if we can get some details. Soon began one of the largest police investigations in Canadian history. The police quickly determined it must have been an abduction. He was taken from there, and tips after tips came in, but nothing substantial. Good evening. It's every parent's nightmare to look away for just a second and find that your young son or daughter has disappeared. What's the last off, image you have of? He went off around behind the cars towards the park. You don't know if he got there or not? We didn't see him get to the park, no. So that's the last memory you have? Yeah. Sit up here and look through at the park. Didn't see him. I told Chris, I can't see him when he goes home. I'll go look for him. He'd asked to go to a nearby playground while his mother played touch football. The playground was within sight of the field, within sight of his father and dozens of other adults. But Michael Dunahy simply disappeared. The abduction of Michael Dunahy is a new kind of crime here, and it calls for new methods. Were you parked here? Yeah. For example, reconvening everyone who had a car in the school parking lot that Sunday. So that was a 12:15. And running through it all again. Who was where? Was there a vehicle here then you don't see here now? I don't remember exactly what it was. I know my view was blocked, so it would have been by something like a van or a truck with a canopy. Over like there, with the cop cars. Right where the police car is? Yeah, I think so. From what I remember. Okay, and uh, it's a brown van? I don't know what color it was. Just a van? It was dark, a dark van. 
That's and one thing I got to point out too, y'all, when you asking all those witnesses about what they have seen, it's almost like the little game you play where you start off telling somebody a message in their ear, and by the time you get to the 10th person, the whole message is just completely different. It's almost like that, man, where all these different people, they're going to start to give you all these different things about what they've seen, and they brain probably ain't even seen it, but they mind start to believe that they've seen something. You know what I'm saying, my brothers and sisters? Am I talking too fast or I'm talking too dumb? Let me know. Or is it or is it real ish? Let me know. Let's go. That's the lead. So far, the only solid lead the police are talking about. A dark colored van or camper or pickup truck parked around here. Now, Michael's parents parked their car at the end of the lot over by the school. And that puts this dark colored vehicle about halfway along the path that Michael would have had to take to get from his parents' car over to the playground. Nobody saw this vehicle arrive and nobody saw it leave, but it disappeared apparently just about the time that Michael did. The strongest theory about what happened to Michael is the brown van theory, which is like literally parents' worst nightmare urban legend type stuff. A year and a half before, someone attempted to kidnap a three-year-old boy not far from that school. He was luring the child into the van with McDonald's toys. A passing woman saw and intervened. She called the cops, but the van fled before they arrived. Some people reported seeing a similar van in the same area at the same time as Michael vanished. A child also drew a picture of it. Hmm. I mean, that's the only theory that I guess you can believe. And not even just the brown van. I guess we we left to believe that he got kidnapped. Long story short, short story long. Let's go. So here, folks, we have a very mysterious and creepy disappearance that takes us to Manchester, New Hampshire. There's always something about like New England. Everything is always creepier in these parts. See, in an apartment in that city lived Judith Rann and her 14-year-old daughter, Laureen. This was in 1980. Laureen's father had divorced her mom when she was a kid, so it was just Judith and Laureen living in a third-floor apartment. Laureen, happy and outgoing, got along well with her mom, had friends, all that. Her dreams, actor, baby, and she was doing good. But there was a couple of reports that she had friends with some less desirable folks. The incident in question happened April 26th, 1980. Laureen, she was home alone. Her mom, Judith, was out uh, watching a tennis game with, uh, with her new boyfriend to play tennis. So Laureen was home alone, Judith was out, and she'd be home late. What happened next? Still kind of up in the air because Laureen, she was only, you know, she was only a teenager. She was 14 years old at the time. But she invited two friends over to the apartment. A boy and a girl. They have never been named because they were minors at the time. So Laureen, a boy and a girl were there and they were drinking. They were drinking alcohol, if you can believe that, even though they're minors. Jesus, kids these days. They were drinking beer and a bottle of wine. The three kids were there in the apartment and shortly after midnight, they heard a noise coming from the hallway, the building's hallway, and they assumed it was Judith, so they were like, oh shit, we better, you know, Judith's come, mom's coming home, we better clear out. The male friend says, whoops, this won't look good if I'm here. He says, Audi 5000, he leaves out the back door. This apartment had a back door that went straight out onto the street. This guy would say he left out through that door, he heard it lock behind him. But the noise they heard coming from uh, the hallway, it wasn't Judith. In fact, Judith wouldn't be home for a following hour with her new boyfriend, this tennis playing boyfriend. Judith arrives to her apartment building with her boyfriend around 1.30 a.m. and they open a door into the apartment building and it's pitch black. In fact, at first they think maybe a fuse is blown, the power's gone, they go up to the next floor, pitch black again. It was then they realized that all of the light bulbs had been removed, had been unscrewed from the hallways of this apartment building. Really weird, like all of the light bulbs in all the hallways. They somehow stumble to Judith's apartment anyway, and they find the door is unlocked. They go into the apartment, and they open the door into Laureen's bedroom, and they see her there asleep in bed. Oh, good. It was then that they noticed that the back door of the apartment, the door was open. Not just like unlocked, like wide open. Pissed off about this, as you can imagine, you're leaving the door wide open in the middle of the night. Judith goes back to Laureen's bedroom to wake her up and be like, what the hell are you doing? Only in the bed wasn't Laureen. It was Laureen's female friend who had been there with her. She says she has no idea where Laureen was. She was just here. She grabbed a pillow and a blanket, said she was going to sleep in the couch. And then she was gone. And the door is open. All her stuff was still there. 
but there was no sign of her, and so they called the police. The cops initially said she must have run away or whatever. They weren't exactly too helpful, but days and then weeks would pass, and she never came home. Jesus Christ, man, all these weird ass freaking like what the is going on type of videos that we have watched in this one video, man. I don't know what the freak going on with this girl, y'all. I'm going to put this out here. And like I said, you know, I'm just throwing stuff out there. I just be throwing stuff at the wall. I'm thinking maybe she went with one of those dudes that was over there with them at the uh place, whatever. What I'm trying to say, long story, short story, long for real. I think that maybe she she went with one of them and she consented to go on with one of them. Like they didn't just kidnap her. She consented to go with one of them, probably to, to do whatever, whatever, and then whoever she went with end up killing her. I uh, maybe. I don't know, man. God leave, man. What the freak happened? How could she? Mm. Some witnesses would say they had driven her to Boston, but later say, hmm, not too actually sure if it was her. Months later, Judith would be charged to call a place in California, a place she knew no one and had never been. She believed those calls had been placed by Laureen. Three calls from two different hotels. One of those calls was made to a teen sexual assistance hotline. Following on that, though, they didn't know anything about Laureen. And one of the hotels where calls had been placed from that were charged to Judith, it was later found that CP had been made in this hotel. Over the following years, Judith would receive calls. Mysterious calls, always at 3.45 a.m., which is when she reported Laureen missing. And she would over answer the phone and there's nobody on the line, or she would just hear breathing. They wouldn't say anything. What happened to Laureen? Was she abducted? Was she trafficked? What about the light bulbs? Who knows? So That's what exactly crazy. happened that night remains a complete mystery. If what, you know, Laureen's male friend said is true, that he, you know, he heard the door lock behind him when they thought that Judah was coming home, then that means someone didn't come in the side entrance. That likely they exited from the apartment, that maybe Laureen left herself. Now, it also should be noted that this male friend later ended his own life, but the police don't believe it's related to the creepy disappearance. So, Laureen gave her friend her bed, and then perhaps left herself out that side door to do... something? Meet someone? Run away? And the light bulbs, what was the story with that? Did someone enter the building, right, unscrew the light bulbs, and then knock on doors looking for a victim? and Laureen was unfortunate enough to answer. This was the middle of the night. Mm. Then, when she opened the door, it would have been pitch black outside, so this mysterious person could attack her. Then perhaps they kidnapped Laureen, took her out the side door and left it wide open? That could make more sense than Laureen leaving herself. If she had left of her own accord, why leave the door wide open? A terrifying mystery indeed. Hey, now Mike just, yeah, Mike just made a lot of sense, y'all. He made a lot of sense with that. I'm going with that as the lean theory. Seriously, because if you factor in the fact that all the light bulbs in the whole apartment, like in the lobby, the hallways of the freaking uh, apartment place was uh, unscrewed. And then you factor in the fact that the door was just left wide open. That's where I know I was just saying, man, that she probably went like on her own accord on her, in, in her consent. Like she consented to leaving. Maybe not, man, because of that door being left wide open. I forgot that part. So maybe somebody just snatched her up soon as because. Think about it now. We got to think about this too. She went laying on the uh, sofa while she let her friend sleep on in her bed, which, you know, we do as good hospitality or good manners whenever you have your friends over. You take the bed, man. You take my bed, I'll take the couch. Okay. So she was gone back up front on the couch while friends sleep in the bed and she hears somebody knock on the door. She opened the door, get snatched up. She gone. That make the most sense, right? I don't know, y'all. I'm trying to make sense of the unsensible man let's go night goddamn nightmarish it was july 1991 and a boy scout troop was heading off for an overnight camping trip this was very exciting all the boys were like about 12 years 12 years of age one of those young boys was 12 year old jared michael negretti 
This was to be his very first overnight trip out in the wilderness, and they were heading to Mount San Gorgonio in the San Bernardino Mountains. It's the highest mountain in the region, but it's classed like a relatively low risk hike. It's a class one hike, which means, you know, it's well marked trail. You can't really go too wrong on it. So it would be fine for like 12 year old boys on their on a boy scout hiking trip. So the group were headed out. There was a scout leader, an adult and six boy scouts. This was on Friday, July 19th, 1991. They were all hiking up the mountain, kids all having a good time, shooting shit, singing songs. But always at the back of the pack was Jared. He was lagging behind constantly. Jared was on the heavier side, so it was, a, it was tougher going for him. He wasn't as fit as the others. Now, the area isn't particularly dense, as in trees, but it is a very, very big area. No animals around at all. It can get eerily quiet up there, other than the mice. And Jared began to fall behind more and more. Eventually, he fell properly behind, but the scout leader and the other kids just kept going. When the scout leader was informed by other hikers, that was like, you know, you're leaving like a kid behind in the middle of these mountains. The scout leader was like, oh, you know, it's fine. We're, we're gonna, we're almost top of the mountain. We'll get him on the way back. Catch on the flip side. Other hikers who saw Jared going down, because he obviously just gave up, they saw him uh, zigzagging down the mountain. He was what's called shortcutting switchbacks. Which is, you know, if you're going up a mountain, you go zigzag, if you just kind of go straight through them. It's kind of like a no-no to do when you're hiking up the mountains, because you can damage vegetation, you can damage the trails, all that sort of stuff. So then, as the scout leader is making their way back down the mountain, as it's getting dark, there was no sign of Jared. No sign of Jared at all. Eventually... The damn scout leader, man, what the fuck? See, that's what, that's, this story right here, one of the ones where uh, make parents not want to leave their children in the care of other uh, adults. Because they don't give a damn about your kids, man. You just going to leave this little boy and say, oh, we'll get him back when we are uh, coming back down the mountain. Like, you just know he going to be right here. And y'all in the middle of damn nowhere climbing a fucking mountain in the wilderness with all these goddamn bears and mountain lions and all that other craziness out here. They make it down to base camp and Jared was nowhere to be seen. They didn't see him and he was not waiting for him. They called the emergency services. For two weeks, 3,000 people combed the San Bernardino National Forest and never found him. To this day, no one knows what happened, whether he tripped and fell or another reason why you don't want to shortcut a switchback is you can easily, like, it's not a trail. You're going off trail then, you can fall off, fall off a cliff, something. Or was it animal attack, was it human attack? No one knows. But what makes this case really frightening is that a footprint of his was found along with some wrappers of some candy and and foods that they knew he had with him. So they found signs of where he had been. They also found a camera Jared had taken with him. Most of the pictures were, you know, what you would expect of the mountain, of the hike, all that kind of stuff. Except the final photo, which was this one. It was a picture of Jared himself, believed to have been taken at night, the flash is on. Was he lost that night and needed the flash? If that's true, wouldn't he have aimed the camera forward? Or was there something behind him? Who knows what happened to Jared Negretti? One detective does believe that Jared wasn't alone on the mountain that day, that night, that he was kidnapped by simple virtue of them searching the entire area. And although they didn't find his body, just traces of where he had been, if he was there, if he had tripped, if he had fallen, they would have smelled something, seen birds gathering. None of this was discovered. There was no signs of a dead body at all in that area, and they did a hell of a search. So he must have been taken away from the mountain. The final picture of Jared Negretti was certainly taken at night, that we do know, when he would have been lost and alone. Maybe alone. It is thought he took it of himself, but what if someone else took that picture? Oh! And there you have it. That is some of the creepiest and most disturbing disappearances I've come across. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it means a lot to me. Hope you enjoyed this whole video. Next one will be up in a couple of days. Uh, but until then, as always, please take care of each other. Please take care of yourselves. Because I love you. Thank you. 
Oh, my brothers and sisters, I did not even think about that. What if somebody else took the damn picture of Jared at the end, man? You can think that it was like a selfie, but hell, it might have been somebody else took that picture, man. Like I said, man, the, first of all, the, the instructor, whoever, he should feel bad for the rest of his life. I hope he feel bad about that, man. You left that little boy down there in the middle of the fucking woods on a goddamn mountain and expected him to be back in the same spot uh, in in your uh peripherals when you coming back down the mountain man like that's just being crazy in a way man like i said that is why parents don't want to leave their damn children in the care of other uh adults because they ain't gonna care about your child like they care about their own you know what i'm saying am i am i lying or am i lying my brothers and sisters or am i keeping it real man but bro sis i did not expect to get this from uh mike Seriously, I did not. I I thought from the title that we was gonna just have one freaking story. I thought we just gonna have one story, and it feel like we got about ten of them, and it's about ten of them that, that and most of them for the most part, I'm gonna be thinking about for the next couple of days. Like, what the freak really happened in this story? What happened to this person, man? All these unsolved freaking mysteries, man. Then another thing for the most most part, or probably all the part, is the fact that none of these people bodies was never found they freaking bodies wasn't even found man like what the hell man some of them and i'm not gonna go all the way back through all of my brothers and sisters because i'll be right here for another freaking hour with y'all and we already been right here for over an hour right now but some of them you had clues where it was like man you know who did it like the first case with the husband who killed the freaking um the son and the uh, and his wife you know what i'm saying because they found out that he was doing something a little strange for a piece of change he killed both of them that's evident that he did it but then you also had some where it wasn't really evident that that person even had something to do with it like the uh husband and wife that was in japan which i think maybe some triads had something to do with it or the the gang the cartel whatever the word you want to use had something to do with it but um they was thinking that it may be the ex-wife i mean not ex-wife she they never got married but they was thinking it was his ex-girlfriend before she get before he got married to his wife you know what i'm saying may have had something to do with it because she was staying in the same city around the time that it got it all happened then when it happened she up and left and went back where she was and all that but it's like dude for that one is number one thing is there's no evidence on the camera but there's evidence literally of these people in the elevator going up to their freaking room you know what i'm saying man going to the apartment man and then that's it we just don't know what happened they just poof back vanished i don't know my brothers and sisters man this one right here man all these y'all all these was freaking crazy man this was great from mike y'all mike was giving me kyle from dial trip vibes you know how kyle be doing the strange and bizarre cases and he give us like 10 8 7 5 and you know just be hitting us boom 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 that's how mike was hitting us right here man that uh mr ball in case that he cover that miss ball and already had covered before that lady she like the human bigfoot like she is a freaking goddamn uh what the word is not a fairy tale not a folklore it's another uh, urban legend she like a urban legend man and she one of those uh stories that you can tell at a camping trip about what happened to her and it, it'll be spooky and it'll be true you know what i'm saying man but i digress my brothers and sisters let me go and let y'all go man i gotta calm my ass down this was such a great video from Mike, y'all, man. It's like these guys just continue to get better and better, and I just enjoy coming back and watching him. If y'all done made it this far, then I know y'all enjoy the truth, too, and I appreciate y'all coming on back to the channel. Like I said, man, y'all make sure y'all come on back tomorrow, but before y'all leave, please, 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 please hit that like button, comment, subscribe, and do all that if you ain't did that yet. And remember this, little piece of happiness, stay safe, don't stop, keep going, yeah.